Um, you're telling us that archaeology is very keen on new ideas and wants to really explore and investigate the past. Is that right? That's my perspective. Yeah. That's your perspective. All right. Let's have a let's have a look at um, at Clovis first. Ah, Clovis first. Something people skeptical of scientists love to bring up, and something scientists love to play down. Let's go ahead and talk about the implications of this bad boy here. Hi, my name is Dan, and welcome to the Dunking. You know what? Right off the bat, I'm going to disagree with Graham. Since everybody's like, oh, you guys are talking now, that means you're never again going to criticize him and you're just going to change and no longer be in the middle and stuff. I'm going to point out where I think Graham went wrong right off the bat because I haven't been doing that last few videos for reasons I've already mentioned. One of the places that I think Graham definitely made a misstep is when he was trying to prove that the Clovis first debate was kind of still going now or had been in very recent times by citing articles that were like, from the Guardian and stuff like that that weren't really scientific papers. And so you mentioned this Clovis first hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. It's been decades. You, you bring up uh, news articles and headlines that say that it's still being debunked. That's not what archaeology is. Our articles ourselves don't say that. Our articles instead present new hypotheses like the Kelp Highway hypothesis because scholars do not write the headlines for media articles. I cannot help how journalists portray what we do, okay? So if Graham wants to demonstrate the debate did or didn't end at a certain point, he should be using peer-reviewed published papers in my opinion. Certainly not just like mainstream journal -y articles because those could be, you know, written by anyone and even an unpublished thing written by an archaeologist. I mean, you could have some guy who was 95 years old and still stuck in his ways from the Clovis first days. So, in my opinion, in order to be demonstrably 100%, you should be using peer-reviewed published, peer -reviewed published papers from modern times. Now, for those of you who haven't unsubscribed from me yet, now's the time. And for those of you who unsubscribed from me two videos ago, now you're like, oh man, he still does criticize Graham. Oh shit, what did I do wrong? So let's carry on with the rest of the video and discuss Clovis first. The basics of the Clovis first hypothesis goes as follows. Two great ice sheets, the Laurentide and the Cordilleron, covered the majority of the North American continent for eons, and around 13,000 years ago they begin to melt, leaving a corridor across an exposed bearing land bridge. Because the sea levels were so much lower, being that all this water was locked up in the ice sheets, there was a fat strip of turf between Asia and America, and this was believed to have been used by the very first inhabitants of the Americas, as there were, and still are, numerous Clovis points for dating around that time period. The belief was the Clovis people were the very first Americans. Clovis points are a unique style of arrow or spear point, and this was used to loosely connect the people across a continent under the umbrella term the Clovis culture. Because the weapon points showed up in the appropriate time to line up with the melting of those ice sheets, this hypothesis looked really good. Two different lines of evidence seemed to point to the very first human feet touching the Americas around 12 to 13,000 years ago, and this became the orthodox position for decades, at least for 50 years. And this was pretty much fine until French-Canadian archaeologist Jacques Cinq Mars showed up in the late 70s at the Bluefish Caves in the Yukon. And when he excavated the place, he found what he was pretty certain were signs of human butchering on mammoth bones. And the dating on the place was around 24,000 years ago. This, this basically doubled the age of the peopling of the Americas. And, and he wasn't shy about it. He had no problem putting this information out into the world. And it was, well, famously or infamously, it was not met with kindness by his colleagues. Science journalist and trained archaeologist Heather Pringle studied under Jock Sink Mars, and in an article on the opposition Sink Mars faced surrounding the Bluefish Caves, she says, But relatively few of Sink Mars's peers shared his confidence. And as I began regularly attending archaeological conferences in the years following that trip to the Bluefish Caves, I saw what Sink Mars was up against. Sitting in halls with Canadian and American researchers, I witnessed what happened when archaeologists presented data that contradicted the Clovis first model. Often a polite bemusement spread through the room, as if the audience was dealing with some crackpot uncle. Or the atmosphere grew testy and tense as someone began grilling the presenter. But once or twice, the mask of professional respect slipped completely. I heard laughter and snickering in the room. She was there. She saw firsthand what he faced. And I think it's important to pay attention to what she says here. Because she doesn't say that all the archaeologists on the planet 
oppose Sink Mars, but she does say that he faced a hegemony of ideas, basically, that, that he faced an uphill battle trying to get his ideas out into the public, and that it ended up damaging his career, that it ended up damaging, most likely, his mental health, although she doesn't say that directly. It's pretty obviously implied from the words that are used there. Now, Flint, he's going to downplay this. That suggests there's an archaeological conspiracy where we're all working together no. to have one narrative. No, it suggests yeah. that there's a strongly held point of view, there's a paradigm, and that those who go against the paradigm are likely to be attacked, like Dillahay. Tom Dillahay, like Jacques Saint Mars. All of them still had successful careers for many decades. But Jacques Saint Mars on, excavated many other sites. Right, but, you but compare that to what Heather Pringle says in her article. It was a brutal experience, something that Sink Mars once likened to the Spanish Inquisition. At conferences, audiences paid little heed to his presentations, giving short shrift to the evidence. Other researchers listened politely, then questioned his competence. The result was always the same. When Jacques proposed that the Bluefish Caves was 24,000 years old, it was not accepted, said William Josie, director of the natural resources of the Vanuit Gwich'in First Nations and Old Crow. In his office at the Canadian Museum of History, Sink Mars turned at the wall of closed mines. Funding for his bluefish work grew scarce. His field work eventually sputtered and died. He enjoyed his summers excavating and exploring the Yukon, trying to find exactly areas like the bluefish caves, but his, you know, funding and ability to do so just slowly withered over the years. And he's not the only guy that experienced such a thing. The guy that Dr Graham Hancock showed in the debate, Tom Dillahay, he experienced very, very similar things. Uh, a lot of things happened during that span of 20 years uh, before uh, things changed, you know. But can you tell me what your thoughts are in terms of the scientific process? Um, considering what took place in terms of the dialogue and all the back and forth that happened, is that what you would have expected uh, from the scientific process? Well, yes and no. Uh, I put together an interdisciplinary research team of people, got National Geographic funding and National Science Foundation funding, um, and uh, that went pretty well the way we expected it to. And I found that the scientists were open-minded. Uh, this includes archaeologists. We, we had Australian, Chilean, uh, and Argentinian archaeologists working with us. Cumulatively speaking, the, those people besides myself probably had close to hundred years of experience amongst them. Um, what surprised me on the other side of the coin was the stiff, uh, closed-mindedness of many North American archaeologists. Uh, there were some North American archaeologists, particularly those who worked in Latin America, Alan Bryan, Ruth Groon, a few others, open-minded. Of course, uh, Monte Bear, they sort of fit the paradigm they were expecting. But I, I found Europeans uh, much more open-minded. Uh, but I, some of the North American colleagues um, were very difficult to deal with, and I, I think at times presenting a very unhealthy uh, atmosphere, uh, cutting us off before we could present the data at meetings, uh, not talking with us about it, uh, refusing to even look at the data, th this sort of thing. Now here it's pretty clear, he faced a lot of opposition when he went public. But he's also clear it wasn't everyone, it was a very select, specific group of archaeologists that opposed him. Now I know that me and Graham are in contact now, so it's expected that I never disagree with him on anything, but I have to say I think that Graham misses the significance of this. The distinction between who is involved with the gatekeeping and who isn't is actually very important in my mind. While it's clear that the people who are most directly connected to the Clovis First model, mostly North American archaeologists, were unscientific in their treatment of the site, North American archaeologists who were working in South America were not opposed to the findings out of hand. In fact, as Dillahay puts it, uh, there were some North American archaeologists, particularly those who worked in Latin America, Alan Bryan, Ruth Groon, a few others, open-minded. Of course, uh, Monte Bear, they sort of fit the paradigm they were expecting. Basically, it's the same old, same old. A few bad apples are ruining it for everyone. Now, Flint's going to say, oh, it's not really that bad. It doesn't really ruin much. And Graham's going to attribute it to more archaeologists than, in my opinion, should be deemed guilty of this crime. Although I can completely understand why. Because, now check it out. He gets a letter. He sees the letter, the SAA letter, for example, to Netflix. And it's from the Society of American Archaeology. And it's got... Effing United States government letterhead, SAA, and 5,000 members strong, 
all it, it makes it come across that 5,000 people think this should be the thing. And when nobody really speaks up in opposition that has an SAA letterhead themselves, it's pretty easy for him to at least lump those 5,000 into the group that think that he should ride off. And so you can't really blame him when he gets a little bit emotional about it, although I will say that that doesn't help a whole lot when you're having the debate, especially the debate on Joe Rogan, because like I mentioned before, it, Flint could bait that. He could straight up be like, poke the bear, poke the bear. I know you're mad. I know you're mad. I know you're mad. You go into the debate. Emotions come out. And I'm like, well, <laughs> what's the deal, man? I didn't say anything. And, and the people that weren't aware of all that shit that happened before, they didn't see it happen in the debate. They saw Graham bring it up in the debate. So they can be like, oh, you're the one that's making this a big deal. But it's like, man, anybody who's in the know knows a lot different. So I see where Graham has a problem here. But it is certainly not all archaeologists. It's just a handful. For example, Thomas F. Lynch wrote papers debunking the idea that Ice Age humans existed in South America, and Dillahay wrote papers in response, and this is all back in the 90s about Monte Verde and sites similar to that. I'll link one of the papers below. After that, you can sign in to view, and it's free, and it doesn't require anything but a Gmail account, and then others are going to show up next to the article, so you can see all the responses these guys had next to each other, and other scientists weighing in, and it's an old debate, but it's very much worth reading, because we'll see quotes like this from Dillahay. A recent review by Lynch of late Pleistocene sites in South America is impaired by numerous errors and misrepresentations. Now, if you've watched my other videos on the debate, I don't really need to explain this parallel to you. You've already seen it. Flint has kind of consistently misrepresented things and misunderstood where Hancock is coming from. And that puts Graham in a position where he does feel justified in just like railing against archaeology in general. Although, again, I will say that I don't think that that's the answer or a healthy path forward. Although I do get why he feels the way he does. Because let's be clear, when Ancient Apocalypse is review bombed before it's been up for a day, it's clearly an attack on his work and his ability to publicly express that work. This has created quite the Hatfield and the McCoy scenario, although in this case we can safely say archaeologists fired the first shots. Just read Fingerprints of the Gods. It doesn't have the combative tone against archaeologists that Ancient Apocalypse does. But back in the 90s, nobody had called Hancock a racist. Nobody was trying to deplatform him. Nobody had conflated his work with things like... They're saying that I embolden extreme voices that misrepresent archaeology archaeological knowledge in order to spread false historical narratives that are overtly misogynistic, chauvinistic, racist, and anti-Semitic. I mean, you apply those labels to somebody and you're going to get that person hated. The point is, I see why Graham thinks the SAA and its 5,000 members are like part of the problem. I, I've said similar things, even though I, I was mostly saying it to piss people off, because in reality, I, I recognize there's a lot of SAA members who really don't have a dog in that fight, although I will point out that if you're a member of a group that's saying stupid shit like this and you let it run amok, you are letting them solely your group, and then guys like me come along and pick at it. But, but you know, that that's getting off a little bit into the weeds. This whole mess got really bad. It, it, it bled into, like, actually endangering Dillahay's life when you look at the Clovis first thing, I mean, by this whole mess. Like, check this out. And plus, politically, from time to time, there were some difficult moments. At my home institution later on, when I left Chile, um, a letter was sent to a dean uh, with anonymous signatures of about 24, 25 people saying this guy doesn't even have a Ph.D., a lie, of course. Uh, you, you should fire him from the university for what he's doing and so on. And another colleague who sent a letter to the newspaper in Chile uh, one of the major newspapers saying that uh, Monte Verde was creation of the CIA to implant me down there. And, you know, th that puts you and your family in a dangerous situation in a country like that at that time. So th there were several other unpleasant things. So the whole sociology of the non-scientific part of, of that enterprise was disturbing at times and made me reveal that there's a small, not a, not a majority, but a minority of people who will do anything in, the, in their power to s defend their paradigm. It was their career, and they had given decades to it. And I, I can see that from a historical viewpoint now uh, as the years go by. But on the other hand, I certainly didn't accept it at the time. I mean, actual fear for him and his family over this debate. 
Decades before social media even, he was attacked for opposing the Clovis Mafia academically and socially, with the social attacks actually having a good possibility of becoming physical. But history shows us the bad actors are just a few people, a vocal minority, something that those of us who spend some time on social media, we've seen how these guys can paint out a group with just a couple of nutters being the public face of it. But in this case, this is the same kind of hegemony actually existed before Clovis first, and it's the same kind of scenario in the Americas, in the debate around the peopling of the Americas. And basically, one guy and his buddy, and then a handful of their cohorts, held the hegemony into place, and kept the peopling of the Americas dating back to about 3,000 years ago, maybe 4,000 years ago if you got crazy, and that was the limit. Ailes Hydrilica, who totally never got made fun of in school for his last name, was an anthropologist in the first half of the 20th century, and he was firmly of the opinion that the site of Folsom, New Mexico was a hoax, because the evidence said the site was about 10,000 years old, and Hedrilica believed there was no way people were in the Americas that far back in time. And as he was the head of the Smithsonian Institute's Physical Anthropology Division, he was well positioned to block finds from being accepted as legitimate. It took a very long time, but eventually the Folsom site was accepted, and Folsom Man became, for a time, the first human in the Americas. But before that, if you wanted to be an archaeologist in North America, you couldn't posit the peopling of North America before 2000 BC and be successful, or you would run amok of Hedrick and his friends, and then they would ruin your career. And this is documented well, links below. So this dynamic isn't new, not even in regards to the debate surrounding the peopling of the Americas. And Flint is right when he points out that it's just a few assholes. Monteverde. How did you feel when he was describing what was ultimately true, but was being dismissed and he was being shut off and people weren't willing to look at the data? How do you feel as an archaeologist? Oh, I think that that's that. complete. I don't mean that what Graham's saying is bullshit. I think it's complete bullshit for any colleagues of mine that try to shoot down actual evidence. That is ridiculous. I'm not trying to say that all of archaeologists Archaeology is like any community of people. There includes some assholes. I have worked with some assholes before. But these assholes have a lot of power, and this is something Graham recognizes because that power gets used against him all the time. But Flint, he doesn't recognize it because he's one of those assholes. Take the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis or Padang. Now both have a stark difference in opinion between the people who publish the papers and the quote-unquote mainstream academics. And both have been attacked by the Atlantis Mafia. But unlike the Clovis Mafia, here we have a group of people of different specialties. These aren't all just North American archaeologists railing against the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, and it's not just Indonesian archaeologists attacking the Ganung Padang paper published by Dr. Danny Nadu Wajaja. Jawa, how you pronounce it, sorry. We have the same few people showing up in all the papers against the Younger Dryest Impact Hypothesis, and a different group of same people showing up in all the articles talking about the Ganong Padang paper. Flint Dibble is one of those names in the case of the Ganong Padang paper, and you might see him talking about the Younger Dryest Impact Hypothesis as well. He railed against the Ganong Padang paper as though it was somehow his responsibility, his expertise, or even something he was aware about before Ancient Apocalypse aired. To put it bluntly, Flint is one of the figureheads of the Atlantis Mafia, and he will bend over backwards to take down ideas that oppose his beliefs. Despite him saying, wasn't Well, one think person. about how many people actually study the Clovis period. That is a tiny period in one area of the world. The majority of archaeologists do not study that. Even American archaeologists, completely irrelevant. most American archaeologists study to the much issue later the periods. He himself is not concerned with his expertise or region of study. He's willing to go anywhere Hancock goes in order to prove him wrong. So for all of you who say I never criticize Graham, here's a criticism point blank. He should not have implied that archaeologists in general have created this paradigm that keeps his work from the public sphere. He should have agreed with Flint when Flint says it's just a handful of assholes to do that sort of thing. And then he should have pointed out that Flint is one of the chiefs among those assholes. You what said I you're do, public enemy number what, one. Yes, I am. To, clearly, clearly, Flint to you because you have and 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 John Hoops uh, for example from the University of Kansas I can play you some stuff from John Hoops too if you want 